the last talk, if we have a minute or two, we, we can chat it up a storm or meet me in the bar. Bar. After the startup comp, we're in the startup competition and then we'll be in the bar. There are automatic safe dialers out there, though. You know, there is something called a Moss Hamilton soft drill. It's basically just a robot that will either brute force the safe or use an amazing series of accelerometers to try to do safe manipulation. To see that in action, it's unfreaking believable. If you're really completely worried about your stuff and your safe, well, you can always get an electronic dial. The, the Kaba, you know, Kaba Moss Hamilton makes this electronic X series safe dial. Does anyone want to admit to working in a building with one of these in it? Okay. They're sweet, aren't they? They're amazing. The little LED display, it's first it's completely self-charging by a Zener diode that spins up, you know, it charges it when you're running it, when you're operating it. The little display, for example, will, st will have different speeds at which it'll go through the numbers. So you'd be like 15, 16, 17, 18, and maybe the next pass it'll be like 15, 16, 17, so it's, it's going faster or slower just randomly. If you stop at one number and turn to another number, it'll jump somewhere on the dial and start proceeding maybe up or down from a different direction somewhere else. So no one can kind of shoulder surf you. The, the logic that's gone into this design is just really, really nice. If the dial turns more than one and a half times without stopping, it shuts down. Well, why is that? Well, because your arm can't do that without letting go. And it knows it's a robot dialer and shuts down for a few minutes. It's, it's that type of thinking that's gone into this mechanism. And it's the reason the government continues to use them. It's a great safe. And it whew, costs. <laughs> But I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, what about destructive entry? I could spend all this money on locks, but like me and my neighbors, we don't want to put crazy locks on our houses because we have windows and my office building has windows on it too. And you know, the door frame is only so solid. Someone could crash a truck through it. Well, yeah, they could do that. You can have destructive attacks coming at you. But the thing is, if this guy comes around to try to get into your company, you're going to know this guy was there. Destructive attacks leave behind very clear evidence. Even finesse you know, ones with a bolt cutter or even a drill attack if a locksmith is using a drill jig, they're immediately obvious. You come in on Monday and you're like, oh crap, someone's been here. Let's execute our policies. Let's put our plan in place. Let's do what we do. You know, you can drill a safe, sure. This is, <laughs> this is from a safe opening weekend that our friends in Europe host about once a year. Uh, ask me about that too. It's a pretty funny story. But of course, you know, you know it happened. That's what you actually want to have happen. You want to have the person smash their way in if they really just want to get in. If you come in on Monday and it's been a non-destructive attack, well, do you know that that happened? If your front door looks fine, if your home office, if you come into your, your main office after a vacation, and oh, it's, this is how I left it before, if your safe is in the same place, doesn't have any big holes in it, do you know no one's been in the safe? Do you not know? Well, depending on the grade of lock you're using, you can't just know for sure unless it's a proper lock. You know, different locks will give you that type of peace of mind, that sort of unpickable lock that I mentioned, like the Protec. I have Protex on all of my firearms, especially when I travel. Now, they're small Protex. They're available in different sizes. I have little ones. And someone said, man, well, you know, what if someone cut the lock off? And I said, well, actually, it's a boron reinforced shackle. It's probably not going to happen. But I'll grant you, someone could have an angle grinder. Someone could cut it off. But there's no way they can reassemble the lock if they've done that. There's nothing they can ever do to get in without me knowing immediately when I go to get my luggage. And similarly, the other side of that coin, when I go to get my luggage and the lock is still on there, I hands down know absolutely in my heart of hearts that no one's been in there. It's just that peace of mind factor that you can go for. Basic locks, once again, let's go through the four categories and, and how do I define them and where do you use them. Basic locks, they have no protection. They are a lot of the ones that you buy in a store. They have no resistance to those dummy attacks, shimming, bumping. Anyone can get in. Resistant locks, in my opinion, should not be able to be attacked by the complete no-brainer attacks. They shouldn't be shimmable. They shouldn't be bumpable. But someone could get in with enough dedication. If I, if I have had some training and you're going to just try it, you'll probably get in in relatively short order. Not instantly, but relatively short order. The real level up that I want you to think is the high security lock, something that, na that needs an attacker with different training, different techniques entirely, something that goes beyond hardening an existing design and saying, let's actually reinvent the wheel here with a better design. And of course, the fourth category of complete badassery, the unpickable, there's only a handful of them out there, and they have their, they have their place You know, if you're really, really doing sensitive work. Where are you going to get them? Obviously, the cheap locks are the ones you find everywhere. 
you can get some of those pick resistant locks at your local, your local shop if you know what to look for and if you can talk to someone who has the right answers or if it's on the packaging. High security locks, you're not gonna find at a local, shore, local store. You, you need a specialized shop. You're dealing with a locksmith at that point. And many of those, if you really wanna get into those crazy high security ones, you're either finding an incredibly specialized locksmith or you're just ordering them online because a lot of locksmiths simply can't carry that amount of inventory of such a specialized item. Do all these locks have a purpose? In, in a way they do. You can use a basic lock if you're locking up your garden shed. You just don't want the neighbor kid taking your hose to make a beer bong or something or taking your ladder to steal your bird feed, because whatever, I don't know what your neighbor kids do. <laughs> but you know, yeah, th that's fine, you can have that lock. If you're protecting $10 worth of stuff, don't use the $100 lock, that's kind of dumb. The big secret in the security world that we should all just admit to ourselves is your house. Nobody wants what's in your house. Nobody wants to, if they want to get in there, they're trying to steal your whiskey and cigarettes or maybe your TV. A pick resistant lock is fine for your house unless you have a home office doing something very sensitive. Because again, someone's gonna break a window if it's a residential attack. Don't worry about your, your home. Worry about your company. Worry about your storage areas. Proper, you know, high security locks, that's what we're talking about in business, that's what you're talking about in a facility that you might not be back at very often. You wanna make sure it's fine in your absence. And you know, your super sensitive stuff, your servers, maybe your guns, who knows, if you just need to know that no one was in there, that's the territory of that super unpickable version. Are you protecting against force or finesse? I kind of touched on that earlier. If someone's just trying to kick their way in, be mindful of that. Are they just you know, gonna break the door down? Well, then maybe you should reinforce the door in addition. Are they just going to, you know, I'm gonna get my way in really tightly, then you really need a finesse, you know, a proper high security lock. It's two different sides of that problem. So what is my notion of a proper physical security framework? What would I love to see in an idealized world? What would companies be held to as a standard? Well, you would think of all your facility in terms of three areas. Every door and every access panel would be one of three things. External access, internal access, or sensitive access. External means people without badges and without any credentials could probably bump into it. You're usually talking about your front door. Maybe some outside doors if you have access panels and wiring panels. Internal, that means somebody you would hope went through some process to get where they are standing to see this lock. Somebody hopefully badged in or was signed in or belongs there in the company and saw that. That's an internal thing for my purposes. And sensitive panels and doors, that's something in my opinion that's termination worthy. If someone is in there and shouldn't be, are they terminated? If someone else gets in there who shouldn't, should the guy who put it in get terminated? Like set, you know, your server room, your records room, that kind of deal. Your executive washroom. Right. Right off the bat, basic locks do not belong in a building. And this would be honestly the hardest part if my sort of framework could be rolled into play. Because you're having plant ops go around everyone's desk and like take wafer locks out of drawers. They do not belong in the building because they encourage horrible habits. The, the user who writes his password and is like, I'm slick, man. I saw that black hats talk. I didn't put this under my keyboard. I'll put my post-it note in my drawer. Woohoo! You know, great, so you have this furniture that you got from W.B. Mason that has the same key on probably half the desks. And even if it didn't, it's a wafer lock on every desk. That just encourages dumb behavior. They don't belong. Every door that you have external to the company, I would like to see high security equipment on those sorts of doors. It's basically, it's not only good just to resist every bozo coming along, because it'll resist a lot of you know, tampering, it'll resist a lot of you know, vandalism. It's just proper for your external doors. Your internal office doors, particularly all your drones who really just kind of get in the way and suck overhead, it's fine. Their, their office door, I, yeah, I, I don't like the corporate environment, you can tell sometimes. You know, pick resistant locks are fine. Someone's not trying to, you know, really just get into, oh, I gotta get into Alice's office because I'm gonna feed her goldfish and he'll get it twice, food, ah, I'm a rogue rebel. No, I mean, no one, no one is really going into all these sort of doors. A pick resistant lock is fine, not a basic lock, Put a couple security pins in there, make it bump proof, do it a little right. And of course, those termination worthy sensitive areas, my ideal world, if I could roll a framework out, I would say unpickable in quotes, you know, category four lock should be used. But again, this is just my ideal perfect world. Take all this knowledge and do what's best for you. That's, that's really my, my overall spiel though, is that it should be, you know, any lock you use, you should never have somebody using complete zero skill attacks. It should leave behind signs of tampering. Someone should have to force their way in if they're gonna get in. That's a good thing. 
Of course, this is all only as effective as your people. If you're not trained, I mean, this is what a plenty of other talks you've gone to at many conferences, including Source, before you've heard about. 